in progress. So here we go. Uh, it's uh, good to be with you. Uh, before we get uh, started, I, I do want to just point out to you some people at the back of the room here, uh, uh, Vicki Harris, who without her, none of this would be happening like this, and she does such a great job. Uh, also to uh, Judy Brewer, who keeps me lined out, and everyone at bay while I'm doing this, and so I thank God for her. Uh, and then behind uh, them is, is Matthew DeStad back there, uh, working on, you can see the waving hand, uh, making sure we have sound. Uh, uh, Marcus was in here earlier putting out uh, uh, drinks for us and everything. So it's, it's always a team effort. So, so blessed to be part of this great team and thank God for their work today. Uh, I also have a couple of announcements to make. We have this little thing in the life of the church this week called Hearts and Hands coming up next week, right? Uh, it's an amazing and exciting time that makes a difference in the lives of many. I hope to see you there. Uh, we are going to have our Bible study, but for the purposes of 10, uh, 10 a.m., we are going to have it in the choir room. So we're going to just move down to the choir room. At 6.30, we'll be back in here in Wesley Hall, um, but we will not have food because why? Because you should have eaten at Hearts and Hands and bought some food um, there. And so that's what we're going to have the kitchen doing, and I hope you'll participate in that. Uh, but uh, we're looking forward to continuing the study and continue uh, keeping it uh, moving and, and right along. So excited. We're getting into some of my favorite parts. Um, of it. But before we uh, jump off into, did I mention this is my favorite book in the Bible? Have you heard that? Yeah, I, it absolutely is. And, and when we uh, jump off into it, I thought we would open with a, a word of, of prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, your love is always with us. In you, we never fail. For you are steadfast and indeed, as the Psalms remind us, your steadfast love endures forever. Help us to see that love, mercy, and grace so perfectly revealed through Jesus Christ, our Lord, even back in these ancient stories that predate even the Psalms. Help us to see and understand what you're doing in our lives, in our world, and even through us to bring your love, mercy, and grace to the people around us who need your presence. Bless us this day with more knowledge about your word, and let that word inspire us to be instruments of your praise in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Friends, we're picking up right where we left off, all the way back in chapter 18. Last week, I had delusions of grandeur. I, I felt like David. Uh, we're going to get through all four chapters, even though David and Goliath, I hope you will, uh, you know, forgive my little editorial nature in that project of going ahead and slowing down a little bit and really focusing in on a story that I was told by many of you, you had heard your whole life growing up. You knew the, 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 uh, some of the, the details of the stories, but you had not actually really dug into the particulars of it. And so I hope you don't mind that we kind of slowed down in that little section to go and zoom a little bit closer. But now we pick up the pace and pick up the action. I mentioned that this story has epic battles. It has Pelotalk. It has all the kind of things you would want in any epic movie. I don't think I had mentioned to you yet we have car chases, right? We got chase sequences. Let's call it that, right? They didn't have cars back then. Uh, we've got movement across country. We've got people jumping out of windows. And we've got nakedness, right? We're going to have to deal with all of that this week. So it's, it's all in there. And I tell you, if, if, the, if the kids knew what was in it, they'd all be reading it for all the wrong reasons. It, it is a drama that unfolds for us. So we're going to jump in. We've just literally seen David kill Goliath, okay? And now he's been brought before Saul to see what happened. Remember, Abner goes and gets him. And then Saul seems to have this moment of amnesia where he forgets who's in front of him. But Jonathan doesn't. That's where we start chapter 18. So let's dive in. And when David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was bound to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. 
Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself to the robe that he was wearing and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him. As a result, Saul sent him over the army and all the people, even the servants of Saul, approved. Now, you may remember about Jonathan, right? Jonathan was the one wanting to go out with his buddies and attack the hills and do something. Here, David comes and did what Jonathan wanted to do, okay? And so he's a hero. So he's enamored with David and and lifts him up. He's the person doing what Saul should have done, In verse 6, as they were coming home when David returned from killing the Philistine, the women came out of all the towns of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they made merry, Saul has killed thousands and David ten thousands. Now, how do you think that went with the dudes? Right? Yeah, you see what's happening here. Saul was angry, it says in verse 8, for this saying displeased him. He said, they ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? Right? Saul sees what's going on. So Saul eyed David from that day on. I'm watching you, right? We still have that saying in our culture, keep an eye on you, right? In verse 10, the next day an evil spirit from God rushed upon Saul while he raved within his house, while David was playing the lyre as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul threw the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice, right? Well, Saul's getting kind of old. He can't throw the spear like he used to. So David, whoosh, whoosh, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. But dude, he's trying to kill him. Like, that's not kind of bad. That's really bad, right? Because that's what paranoid people do to people who they perceive as a threat to their power. They kill them, right? We've seen that throughout the centuries. In verse 12, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. So Saul removed him from his presence and made him a commander of a thousand. And David marched out and came in, leading the army. David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. When Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in awe of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David. For it was he who marched out and came in leading them. Then Saul said to David, here is my elder daughter Meribah, right? So if I'm not going to kill you, you got to become kin, right? You got to kind of join the family. I will give her to you as a wife, only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, I will not raise a hand against him. Let the Philistines deal with him, right? So what's he going to do? He's going to send him out to die because that's what bad kings do. Bad bad kings here in chapter 18, verses 17, right? What they do is they basically send people to die so that they have an easy way to solve their problem. And in verse 18, David said to Saul, who am I and who are my kinsfolk? My father's family in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king, right? He can't believe this. How is he going to be son-in-law to the king? But at the time when Saul's daughter Meribah should have been given to David, see, David made the mistake and lived. Saul wasn't intending to keep his pledge. She was given to Adriel, the the Maholathite, as a wife. Now, Saul's daughter, Michal, right? Thank goodness he has another daughter, right? Michal loved David, 
Saul was old and the thing pleased him. Saul thought, let me give her to him that she may be a snare for him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Okay, I mean, that's bad. (laughs) That's bad. I'm going to give you my younger daughter in the hope that because of the battles you'll go fight for me, you die. But of course, the bigger the group that he sends David out against, the more God's protection of David is shown, and the more the people love who? The king sending out people to battle or David, David, right? Kind of backfires. And continuing there in verse 21, therefore Saul said to David a second time, you shall now be my son-in-law, right? Verse 22, Saul commanded his servants, speak to David in private and say, see, the king is delighted with you and all his servants love you. Now then become the king's son-in-law. So Saul's servants reported these words to David in private. And David says, does it seem to you a little thing to become the king's son-in-law, seeing that I am a poor man and of no repute? The servants of Saul told him, this is what David said. Then Saul said, thus shall you say to David, the king desires no marriage presence except, all right, friends, this has got to be one of the most unusual dowries in the whole of scripture, except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines, that he may be avenged on the king's enemies. Now Saul planned to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. When his servants told David these words, David was well pleased to be the king's son-in-law. Before the time had expired, David rose and went along with his men and killed 100 of the Philistines. And David brought their foreskins, which were given in full number to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. Saul gave him his daughter Michal as a wife. But when Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that Saul's daughter, Michal, loved him, Saul was still more afraid of David because now he's a royal, right? He's powerful. God is with him, and he's a royal. He's in trouble, Saul is. So Saul was David's enemy from that time forward. And that chapter ends with verse 30. Then the commanders of the Philistines came out to battle. And as often as they came out, David had more success than all the servants of Saul. So that his fame became very great, right? So their whole plan backfires and kind of goes wrong on them. So if we can look at that next slide for us. I put up a little issue, right? I mean, so the thesis this week is kings are bad, but dynasties are worse, right? And and so the, remember, God has said to them, you don't really need or desire a king, right? A king is, is the wrong way to go. What you really need is to follow me, right? When they come out of Egypt, back when they're they're wandering in the wilderness, God is clear, I will be your God and you will be my children, right? Trust in God, not, I showed you all Psalm 146, not the princes of this world, trust in God. On our currency, we have what? And God, we trust. We are supposed to be those kind of people, who place their trust on God, not governments, right? And um, here, what we have is a good reason why. Because you just thought priesthoods got jacked up with family. But let me tell you, dynasties in this ancient Near East world also get messed up. Because everything going on is unusual, to say the least, Like, do the children not know that their befriending their father's rival would be treasonous? Is it coincidental that Jonathan, when he went out, chose an armor bearer who happened not to be out of Samuel's line, but was out of Eli's line, which is exactly what you would do if you were going to compete for your father to get power? because it makes your father look illegitimate, right? There's some issues here. Then additionally, um, you know, 
Saul has this kind of unusual way of doing things, right? Every time a son or David does something where he feels threatened, what does he do? Javelin, right? I mean, he's worse than, who, who's the, uh, the it's uh, Zeus, right? Up there, supposed to be lobbing thunderbolts in Greek mythology. I mean, he's as bad as Zeus. You know, every time somebody's doing something, he's going to zap them, right? My mom had been raised Church of Christ, and she was very disappointed at my ordination that they did not install a zapper for me. <laughs> like, she thought I could just get people. Now, if you think that myth is true, please, I don't want to dispel your faith, but I, I don't actually have a zapper. Right? Doesn't quite work like that, but it's kind of disappointing. Well, he thought he had this zapper, but apparently he wasn't very good. There's this be my son in law or die, and this most unusual dowry. And then Jonathan loves the idea that now dad has a real problem and seems willing almost to give up his birthright to be on David's side. Like, really kind of unusual. And we'll talk about that more as we go and get into that some more. McCall, of course, well, once she gets married, she loves him. And so she's all in and does things for David. You're going to see this come out more. And then here, I can't understand why the royal family saves David. Because it's really, as you're going to see, the children of Saul that saved, unless they've totally bought into a couple of things, right? Either he is possessed by an evil spirit, should have been overthrown, or they themselves are desirous of a power grab. It would be very common in first century, or I'm sorry, I keep saying first century, in ancient Near East cultures is what I meant to say, in the ancient Near East culture, for that to be what occurs. So it needs to be just kind of there in our background, Okay. We'll have that as we jump into chapter 19. We ready? We're going to make it all the way to 22 today, so let's keep going. And I know many of you will like the next slide and who's on it, so we'll, we'll go ahead and put the, the other slide up for the end of this next chapter. So in verse, uh, not, uh, sorry, chapter 19, verse 1, Saul spoke with his son Jonathan and with all his servants about killing David, but Saul's son Jonathan took great delight in David. Jonathan told David, my father Saul is trying to kill you, therefore be on guard tomorrow morning, right? So he's not using a spear this time, he's coming with the guards to take you out, right? That's the upshot. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself. I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak to my father about you. If I learn anything, I will tell you. In verse 4, Jonathan spoke well of David to his father Saul, saying to him, the king should not sin against his servant David because he has not sinned against you and because his deeds have been of good service to you. For he took his life in his hand when he attacked the Philistine and the Lord brought, you, brought about a great victory for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against an innocent person? By killing David without cause, Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan. Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall, ba- shall not be put to death, right? So Saul seems to repent, right? I'm not going to put him to death. So Jonathan called David and related all these things to him. Jonathan then brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before, Again, there was war, and David went out. So, so everything works well, right, until what? He's going to go out against the Philistines. What's going to happen? How many people is Saul going to kill? How many are David going to kill? Thousands, right? And, and you see what's about to happen. In verse 8, again, there was war, and David went out to fight the Philistines. He launched a heavy attack on them, so that they fled before him. Then an evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul, as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand, while David was playing music. Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he eluded Saul, so that he struck the spear into the wall. David fled and escaped that night. All right, so how many times has Saul missed David? Is that the third time? Third time, okay. 
You would think while he was playing on the instrument, it'd be hard to be like, you gotta, that's kind of hard to play when you got to keep one eye up to make sure you don't get impaled, right? I mean, like, that's a lot. And then uh, here it is. We're, we're going to have a little kind of, um, I, think, I think we've got time to read through it. So let's, let's just try to keep going. Uh, Saul sent messengers to David's house to keep watch over him, planning to kill him in the morning. David's wife, McCall, told him, if you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So McCall let David down through the window. He fled away and escaped. Right? The chase sequence is about to begin. McCall took an idol and laid it on the bed. She put a net of goat's hair on his head and covered it with the cloaks. Clothes. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. He said he is sick. Then Saul sent the messengers to see David for themselves. He said, bring them up to me in the bed that I may kill him. When the messengers came in, the idol was in the bed and the covering of goat's hair on its head. Saul said to McCall, why have you deceived me like this and let my enemy go so that he has escaped? McCall answered Saul. He said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? Now David fled and escaped. He came to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him, right? So if you're in a civil war that's breaking out, not of your own making, who do you go to? The one who anointed you, right? I mean, I would go back to, hey, do you remember when you did that thing with the horn of oil? <laughs> that's causing some trouble now, right? Because Samuel had anointed him, right? Now, it's questionable. Does Saul know that he's anointed? Kind of. Saul sees what God does when David is God's own, right? And we're told that the Spirit had left Saul and moved to David, right? So that's an interesting thing. So there's some awareness by behavior and what's going on. But now he flees to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. He and Samuel went and settled at Naoth. Saul was told, David is at Naoth and Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to take David, right? Um, when they saw the company of the prophet in a frenzy with Samuel standing in charge of them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also fell into a prophetic frenzy. When Saul was told, he sent other messengers, and they also fell into a frenzy. Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they also fell into a frenzy. Then he himself right, went to Ramah. He came to the great well that is in Seku. He asked, where are Samuel and David? And someone said they were at Naoth and Ramah. He went there toward Naoth and Ramah. And the Spirit of God came upon him. As he was going, he fell into a prophetic frenzy until he came to Naoth and Ramah. He too stripped off his clothes and he too fell into a frenzy before Samuel. He lay naked all that day and all that night. Therefore, it is said, is Saul also among the prophets? Right? I mean, friends, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, wow, right? So what I thought would be fun is when I think of uh, 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 prophets being crazy, I always remember Matthew McConaughey and the bongo drums in Austin getting arrested. And so I think about his crazy antics. Not very prophetic, although, you know, he may run for governor. You know, so fascinating guy. Um, but, um, but anyway, also handsome guy, right? So he looks, he looks good up there. Uh, but here's what happens. And, and, you know, I mentioned the three little pigs earlier about something. You see that pattern uh, go where there's these three things that happen, right? And you catch those verbs in there, okay? Saul sends, Saul sends, Saul sends, Saul goes, right? That third time it flips. Uh, it's, it's a pattern you're going to see over and over in the storytelling that's here, but it's, it's kind of a potent and beautiful thing. So what are we to make of this? 
It's a strange story to me. I don't know about you, but have any of us fell out in a prophetic frenzy recently? Right? Um, I, I, I personally haven't had that experience. I've had some other stuff that's kind of interesting, but not that. And um, I don't know what to make of it. Does anybody know anyone falling out in a prophetic frenzy? Right? We can go up to Rusk, Texas and, and check out people who, I mean, you know, it's, it's a weird thing they're describing in our world. In that world, there was an expectation of priests and prophets that this would occur, right? So this is something that symbolizes to people that they are of that. What I think we should take away from this is this idea that God will go to any length to protect God's chosen, okay? And so God is willing to humble Saul in this way. You're going to pick up when we get to the, the kind of David and Jerusalem things in 2 Samuel that tie into Chronicles. You're going to, we're going to talk about uh, how David's wife did not approve of a frenzy that occurred during the coronation procession, okay? But I just want you to know that, that in uh, 1 Samuel, I think that what we should be taking out of this is not a really fixation on somebody playing the bongo drums and dancing, right, and falling out in the field, but instead on this idea that God would do anything so that David would survive and thrive, okay? All right, let's, let's keep going there. And uh, uh, now I did that without saying anything bad about Matthew McConaughey, right? Everybody knows I like Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, Linda? Mm-hmm. Uh, not according to Samuel, because God had given, we were told right before that happens, God had given up on Saul. I think, I think the question is, it, what? Right, but king by office only. Right. A uh, king by the office he was in and by the ways of people. But at the moment that uh, David was anointed by, by Samuel, I would argue that in the eyes of God, he became king. And that would really explain how the text falls out. All right. Um, there's this interesting uh, kind of thing here about uh, David and Jonathan. And I, I think for the purposes of our time, I, I think I can make it through it. So, so let's see. Uh, David, in chapter 20, verse 1, David fled from Naoth and Ramah. He came before Jonathan and said, what have I done? What is my guilt? And what is my sin against your father that he is trying to take my life? He said to him, far from it, you shall not die. My father does nothing, either great or small, without disclosing it to me. And why should my father hide this from me? Never. But David also swore, your father knows well that you like me. And he thinks, do not let Jonathan know this or he will be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, there is but a step between me and death. Then Jonathan said to David, whatever you say, I will do for you. David said to Jonathan, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king at the meal, but let me go so that I may hide in the field until the third evening. If your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly asked leave of me to run to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. If he says, good, it will be well with your servant. But if he is angry, then know that evil has been determined by him. Therefore, deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a sacred covenant with you. But if there is guilt in me, kill me yourself. Why would you bring me to your father? Jonathan said, far be it from you. If I knew that it was decided by my father that evil should come upon you, would I not tell you? Then David said to Jonathan, who will tell me if your father answers you harshly? Jonathan replied to David, come, let us go out into the field. So they both went out into the field. 
Jonathan said to David, by the Lord, the God of Israel, when I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow on the third day, if he is well disposed toward David, shall I not then send and disclose it to you? But if my father intends to harm you, the Lord do so to Jonathan, and more also, if I do not disclose it to you, and send you away so that you may go into safety." May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. Okay, it's going to continue for a while like this in chapter 20. Basically, they devise this plan of going out into the field the next day. And what's going to happen is that you're going to have that Jonathan is going to do a little archery. Okay, and he's either going to leave the arrows in the field, go out to David and recollect him and bring him back, or uh, he's going to have his servant boy sent away and say, we're done and we're going back. And if they're done and going back, that means David needs to run. And they have a beautiful farewell at the end of the chapter that we'll get to. But before we do that, I, I just want to ask you a question like, are there any stories in the Bible about brothers going out in the field in a family that has dysfunction? What? Cain and Abel, right? What happens in that story? Right? There's an offering to the Lord that is pleasing. The other one becomes jealous of the offering and then kills the brother for the pleasant offering, right? I won't make a direct, I mean, I'm not going to hang my salvation on whether or not the author of this portion of the story has that in mind in the retelling of what happened. But the way they write it in Hebrew, there are more than kind of casual allusions back to that Genesis story as we get into chapter 20. They look back and they kind of focus in on that challenge and make sure that we have that kind of clear in our mind. And in some ways, the covenant forged by Jonathan with David undoes the fall that happens with Cain and Abel. Not the fall with Adam and Eve, that will come later, right? But that, that kind of issue with Cain and Abel, it's a different way of doing things where suddenly brother and brother are able to coexist. And it's that ability of brother and brother to live together and to find a different way of coexistence, right, that becomes why God might have chosen David to do something different and where the Davidic line that will reconcile all humanity seems to be forged and come from. Okay, so just a little extra in there. Uh, let's jump to the end of that chapter just for the sake of time a little bit. And um, I gave you a good paraphrase of it. Um, as it becomes obvious uh, here of what has happened, um, let's look down here. I think it's in, um, yeah, uh, in 41. Uh, uh, so this is in chapter 20, verse 41. As soon as the boy had gone, David rose from beside the stone heap and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He bowed three times, and they kissed each other and wept with each other. David wept the more. Then Jonathan said to David, go in peace, since both of us have sworn in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord shall be between me and you and between my descendants and your descendants forever. He got up and left, and Jonathan went into the city. And remember what happens with Cain and Abel is that there's a division of the family of God and a literal uh, these, these people go become this people and this people. Here there's a reconciliation of families. So I, I think that's a, another point kind of reminding you of that Cain and Abel story that this plays out very differently, thank goodness. And in chapter 21, David goes to Nahab, right? And um, here, I, you know, I just want to, before we get into that, let me just let me just kind of like put the picture before you. So if we go to the one with uh, uh, the three pictures across the next slide. 
Um, do you recognize any of those people? Yeah, so, so what, what's, this, what's this show here? Dallas, right? What's this? And what's that? Oh, Game of Thrones. There you go. You got the one, two, three, right? You got all of it kind of coming together. And then on the next slide, right, it's this kind of ancient version. Um, uh, you know, we just walked through it, but it, it, it is kind of worth uh, kind of just, you know, there's the, the kind of, hey, dad's trying to kill me. Uh, what's interesting is that Jonathan teams up with David, right? Uh, that seems unusual, Right? I mean, if somebody came and said, my father was trying to kill them, I would say, what did you do? Right? When you say that, I mean, I don't know, I guess it depends on the relationship. But it seems like an odd choice by Jonathan, unless he was already kind of out to replace dad, right? Uh, Saul, you know, obviously sentenced David to death. Um, and yet Jonathan uh, helps David flee. So even though he has a promise from dad, it's very obvious that what happens in that inner scene at the banquet, um, it will be very clear where um, there's one other sequence in there that we, is probably important to the story, and that, that is that, that uh, Saul will, will get there and basically say uh, to his son, Jonathan, uh, he, he, he tries to turn on Jonathan and kill him, and you're a completely worthless person born by a no-good mother. I mean, he's, he's not very nice. It's creative cussing if you want to read it. It, it kind of, in Hebrew, um, it's, it doesn't read very well. And um, he's up, Saul's upset uh, with, uh, with Jonathan, and he turns on him. And it's from there that he knows to go and tell David what's going to happen. Right? That's right. That's right. And so then, uh, flee. So when we go to the next slide here. Uh, you know, how do we understand their friendship, kinship, alliance, their covenant that they make? Uh, I think it's, it's meant to be looked at in a covenant relationship. And I believe that it, it actually gets to the core of what we believe God is doing in the Davidic covenant. Um, you're going to see this in 2 Samuel 7 when we get there. Um, I, I think you're going to get a lot of stories that will allude to Genesis to be able to point forward to what happens in 2 Samuel to look toward the expectations placed on the Messiah. Okay. And here, what you have is you have an alternative to the Cain and Abel story about how people can be reconciled. And I think in Jonathan and David, that's what comes forward. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, well, let's uh, jump into 21, and I think we'll get there since we kind of worked through 20 quickly. I apologize. I do encourage you to go back and read it. I'm not skipping over it because it's not good to read just of all the different parts. It's less important than some of the other stuff we'll cover. So um, I just uh, do encourage you to read it uh, as well. But in chapter 21, David came to Nob to the priest Ahimelech. Ahimelech came trembling to meet David and said to him, why are you alone and no one with you? Right, that's good hospitality. Are you okay? You know, and, and kind of priest of Nobbies, right? I mean, he, that's a nice way to greet someone. David said to the priest Ahimelech, the king has charged me with a matter and said to me, no one must know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what have you at hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is there. All right. So is David telling the truth? The king sent him. Well, kind of, right? <laughs> he's uh, about, about here because of the king, but yeah, I mean, he's lying, lying through his teeth. Right? It's kind of a fascinating problem, right? He has some situational ethics here, right? He's trying to live, right? In verse 4, the priest answered David, I have no ordinary bread at hand, only holy bread, provided that the young men have kept themselves from women. David answered the priest, indeed, women have been kept from us as always, when I go on an expedition, the vessels of the young men are holy, even when it is a common journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? 
So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there except the bread of the presence, which is removed from before the Lord to be placed by hot bread on the day it is taken away. Okay, now this will be referenced in Jesus's story when people are asking him, is it okay, right, to do things on the Sabbath and to feed uh, his disciples? And he references back to this story about what's okay to do, right? But they kind of, because God is with David, David kind of bends the rules for survival, okay? Now, in verse 7, now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name is Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's shepherds. David said to Helimelech, is there no spear or sword here with you? I did not bring my sword or my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste, right? So now you have to make up another lie to support the lie, right? It's kind of interesting. Uh, The priest said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, who you killed, right? You remember? In the valley of Elah is here, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it, for there is none here except that one. David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. Okay? I mean, how do, I mean, you get what's going on here, right? I mean, David knew his sword from Goliath was there right? Like he knew where to go to get help and what he needed. So he goes, gets help, and what does what's needed to do that. I think the question is, is Ahimelech actually aiding and abetting against the king? I mean, how many of y'all remember the old stories of Robin Hood, right? Right, or Zorro, right? And there's always a friar or priest willing to kind of help them out, right? I mean, is that what's going on here? Or is this something where he really is unwitting? This is where the Hebrew language could use a little more nuance to help a reader out. But both readings would be perfectly understandable given what we're about to keep reading. So it says in verse 10, David rose and fled that day from Saul. He went to the king of Achish of Gath. Okay, y'all didn't gasp. Like, what's wrong with going to Gath? Who's in Gath? What? That's where Goliath was from. The Philistines are there. He's going to the enemy, Ma. You know, I mean, friends, come on. He's he's going to a place that is owned by the enemy, the peoples he's been killing. So he goes to this king in Gath. The servant of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him dances? And now he throws back that little thing the women sang, right? Saul has killed thousands and David his ten thousands. In verse 12, David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of King Achish of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them. He pretended to be mad when in their presence, right? He scratched marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Doesn't that make you look crazy? Achish said to his servants, look, you see the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen? <laughs> Do we not have enough people that are in, you know, out there that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Right? I can't welcome him, not just because he's an enemy, but because he's deranged and crazy. And that's why he must be here, right? There's another explanation for why he would have been expelled from Saul's presence that's plausible to the enemy. So in verse, uh, chapter 22, verse 1, David left there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and all his father's house heard of it, they went down there to him, right? So family come to the rescue, Everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him, right? Anybody who had a beef with King Saul. And he became captain over them. Those who were with numbered about 400. So he's got about 400 people who gather to this mighty cave, okay? It's got to be of great size uh, for that to happen. David went from there 
to Mizpah of what's that next word? Boo! I mean, he went to the Philistines, and now he's going to the Moabites. I mean, that's, that's crazy, right? Maybe it's because of Ruth, right? Right? His great-grandmother would have been a Moabite. He said to the king of Moab, and this is really touching, actually, in a way, please let my father and mother come to you until I know what God will do for me. Right? He's protecting mom and dad because he doesn't want them killed in a civil war. He left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. Then the prophet Gad said to David, do not remain in the stronghold, leave and go into the land of Judah. So David left and went into the forest of Hereth. Saul heard that David and those who were with him had been located. Saul was sitting in Gibeah under the Tamarisk tree on the height with a spear in his hand and all his servants were standing around him, ready to jump out of the way at a moment's notice, I'm sure, right? Saul said to his servants who stood around him, Here now, you Benjaminites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? Is that why all of you has conspired against me? No one discloses to me when my son makes a league with the son of Jesse. None of you is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as he is doing today. Doeg the Edomite, you remember him? He was the over the shepherds who saw what was going on at Nob, who was in charge of Saul's servants, answered, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob to Ahimelech, son of Ahitabad, uh, sorry, um, Ahitab. He inquired of the Lord for him, gave him provisions, and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. All right? So definitely he thought he had aided and abetted David. And so this leads to a scene here, which is I think is where we'll kind of bring to the end of chapter 22. If you'll go up with that next slide, Saul wants to wipe them out, all of them. And it's a pretty disturbing bloodletting. Uh, he'll bring uh, uh, Ahimelech before him, and he will wipe out all the priests, and then what he'll do is he'll, uh, he'll basically lead all of those, the priests of Nob, um, to, uh, you know, basically be wiped out. Uh, Ahitub uh, was not wiped out. He flees to David, and David does two things that are pretty impressive. Um, David says, I'm responsible. It's my fault, and I'm sorry. All right. Pretty, pretty not, not common for a leader of people in the ancient Near East cultures that we're talking about. And then the second thing he does is he says, you will be safe with me. I will now take care of you. Okay. So what do we do with these kind of um, stories, these situational ethics of David, the, the kind of willingness to do, well, you know, I think the first thing is, remember, there's a war going on, right? I mean, there is definitely a movement here towards civil war. Troops have now gathered around David, and now uh, you're going to have David and Saul battling it out in the next few chapters. Uh, The second thing is, is that along the way, you'll see at key points, when David does something like tells a fib to save his own hide, He always goes back and makes restitution. Um, He repents of the situation. He tries to do that in the early years. Later, you'll see something different, right? But here, when he realizes what had befallen these priests of Nob, what does he do? It's my fault. I will take care of you and your household forever, right? Kind of cool. So on the very last slide, if we can, what do we do with this stuff, right? I mean, is it just propaganda, right? Uh, Have you ever uh, read any Shakespeare? Anybody ever read a Shakespearean play? Like, what's a play by Shakespeare? A Hamlet, Macbeth, 
A Midsummer's Night Dream. What? Richard the First and anybody heard the, the the ones about the different English kings, right? Uh, Henry the Henry the Fourth and Henry the Fifth, right? The, these plays, the, the, these uh, these plays that are out there in Shakespeare, right? Were in um, some of them were beautiful fancy, many of them were propaganda written in the Elizabethan era, right? To to be able to show you why it's so much better that she was in charge now. Right? That they're written to show you how the royal family is the great family. So, one of the things we get are these issues of if God had chosen Saul, why does David get to become king? That would be a question that would be prominent in the minds of the people of Israel. This story answers that question first, second, third, fourth, right? But it doesn't mean it doesn't also tell us a whole lot of truth about who we are as humans, the way like, uh, you know, Richard III would, right? It digs into that. But God takes that human story that's got all the issues of being a national document, because remember, friends, this isn't just something somebody who is like way off to the side, who doesn't really care about anything going on in the nation, is just writing about nothing in particular. It's what they're doing to forge an identity as the people of God, but also as a nation that has land and specific things attributed to that group of people. And they cared in great particularity about things like royal succession and what should happen. And I'm going to go even further to say, at the time we kind of get it from, right, when it's kind of put in its final form in the Babylonian captivity, and we kind of inherit that to us today, they also wanted to be very clear, who are we supposed to follow? Kings? God, right? That's a facetious, that's a false question. But I mean, I think they're really driving that point home so that even King David in Samuel's telling of the story will have massive flaws that show why we shouldn't follow kings. But there's more to come. We'll go through that. I do apologize about all the reading. Um, I'm going to, did the, using the excerpts work for people to do like that? Or because I'm trying to keep us on task to be able to get through First and Second Samuel before Christmas, okay? And that way, uh, too, when I talk about the Davidic promise at Christmas time and Jesus's birth, it'll, you know, be right in that richness of it. But also, too, uh, because we're going to go to Luke in the new year. All right? Any questions? Uh, we've got uh, people on Zoom and people in person. Any any questions? I know that was a lot of material. Yeah. Right. So Peggy asked a question that I want to make sure the people on Zoom hear, um, and that is, is why did David go to his enemies instead of other people for help? And um, I think that the, um, there's that old saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right, and so I think David is David uh, is counting on the idea that getting out of Saul's grip and power, getting beyond the let's call it a jurisdiction that uh, that Saul had control over, right? Getting out of that place where he could do something, he would get safe, even if that meant he had to go through some enemies. Now, when he goes to Gath. He kind of misjudges that one, right? Because Akish is going to kill him, right? But I think there's also a movement here that says, uh, you know, it's fascinating about um, how to say, what do we do with the Moabites? That's still, uh, even from uh, re- my uh, studies of Ruth uh, last week for the sermon on Sunday, that still kind of um, doesn't all jive with me. I'm not pleased where I end up with the Moabites. Uh, so at the time of... Um, at the time of David, there would be a time of somewhat peace, but there's definitely bad blood and a bad history. That's right. Yeah. 
You kill Goliath from Gath is what Peggy's saying. And then here you go right to them like here I am. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, 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 I definitely think David has some despair at times. I don't think he has a death wish, though. I, I do think he is genuinely, when I read the text, some people have read it that way. Uh, I, I'm, I really think that, that he has a genuine desire to keep fleeing, and that, that's kind of the way I, I read it. Um, but yeah, like, how do you, I don't, I, I don't quite, I mean, maybe there's a, they're expecting a nobility amongst the warriors who, who would, because there is respect for David, but it's, it's clear that it's not a respect of uh, another comrade, but instead somebody they want to take out. Yeah, back at the back. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. So, so, so uh, that's a great question, Linda. So what Linda asked for that, those on Zoom, uh, Linda asked, uh, there's no, there's no kind of recording in this of, uh, of David petitioning or seeking God in it, right? And what I don't really know what to do with, and there, I have yet to find a really good resource on it. I found some theories about it, but, but, but who are these priests of Nob? And how do they fit into what Samuel's doing? And who Samuel is, right? Um, I, I don't. I, I do. I also think there was a problem, right? Um, when you go back and you uh, remember when uh, McCall hides David, what does she put in his bed? An idol. What is the king's daughter doing with an idol? Did anybody else go? What? What? So, so there, there's a lot going on here that, that is kind of um, problematic and part of the challenge, um, and I would say really pre-Solomon, that the royal family still has a lot of um, things that are not deep faithfulness. So I think Linda's question is just spot on uh, about the kind of the lostness and, hey, isn't this new guy supposed to go to God? I mean, isn't that why God chose him? I wonder, though, if it doesn't tell us something about us a little bit. You know, sometimes in my experience, God has to save someone first before they know to go to him, you know? Uh, there are times when people are so kind of beaten down by their life experience and challenged by what's gone on that until they actually get a kind of helping hand or a, a loving hug or that thing that lifts their soul, that somehow they can't see that they need God. But that little bit of compassion unturns everything. So um, obviously it's, it, you know, we're told that God is with David the whole time. But boy, I would like a little more prayer, offering, do something, right? Instead of just stealing some bread and grabbing a sword, right? Yeah. That's right. That's right, right. But we don't have any of him going to it or doing it, right? And so that's, yeah, he uses a <laughs> church became an excuse so he could escape. So if you're ever in a bind, just remember, oh, friends, I got to go to church, right? You could get on out. Um, I do think it's fascinating, though, in Jesus's story, um, this kind of bread of the presence, what's going on there. There's kind of a, an intentional, um, anybody who would have been reading the texts about Jesus would definitely look back to these stories of David and see similarities, but also differences, right? And so I, I think that's um, important to know. Right. Yeah, so you already saw what what, uh, what what I was going at there. I was thinking of, obviously, Uriah the Hittite and what's going to happen with Bathsheba. I kind of set that up. Uh, we, got, we got a few more weeks till we get to that. But yeah, I was, I was kind of saying, he's learning from Saul. So, you know, like there's this little bit of, uh, you know, how to say, uh, when he's young, he didn't do that, right? There's, there's something that happens. Um, you remember, uh, when we get to 2 Samuel, it will say, at a time when kings went out to war... David walked on his roof. 
That's a bad thing. You keep hearing about Saul, right? This little phrase we heard, I think, uh, twice, that he's sitting holding his sword. Like, or I guess it would be over here, right? But, but that's, you see the problem? Like, like, that's not what warriors do. Warriors go to the enemy. The Philistines came out on the field, they go. And of course, the problem for us is in Hebrew, go is meant for so many things. <laughs> So, but here it's what you're supposed to do if, if God calls, right? Yeah, yeah, Robbie. Right. Right, so, so let, me, let me repeat that. What, what's going on with these priests at Nob who seem like they would be revered and held in high esteem who get killed by the king? There seems to be no fear in Saul that he is going to do that. I, I think that's a great question for any, um, any uh, tyrannical ruler, right? Any ruler who is paranoid and consolidates power. There tends to be a pl- time when they become... Um, uh, not fearful of God or priests or the church. I mean, I think that's a normal kind of understanding of things. Um, there, there's a great story, you know, when, um, what did, do y'all, do y'all know the story of Napoleon Bonaparte? Y'all would know who he is, you know, kind of thing. Um, you know, of course, I mean, he impacted Western civilization dramatically like nobody else in the 19th century. Uh, when he went to be crowned emperor, right, he put his crown on his own head, Right, I mean, when when you when you make that move to become this kind of uh, you know paranoid tyrant, you can't have anything else be the reason you're in power. So you have to eliminate every threat. Right, think like a Joseph Stalin here, uh, Saddam Hussein. I mean, uh, in a more modern context, I mean, these kind of people they have to kill people who pose threat. They have to wipe out um, have to wipe out any uh, group that would seem to have power. Right. So, um, or that other people would listen to as a counterpoint to what they're saying. Right. And so that that happens in human nature. I mean, I think it's kind of built in. So that's what's going on here. I think that what you're saying is a question for Israel: is what role will priests play? It's also fascinating now. Now at this point, Samuel's got to be pretty pretty old. But you know, Samuel's smart enough to stay out of it. He does the anointing, God wanted David, and then he kind of hits the road. Now, he helps out a little bit when David comes to him, which is good, but you're going to see some more things where, you know, Samuel is kind of beginning to withdraw some. Yeah, you know, I think Samuel would have been a harder target in in due to age. Also, by this time, Samuel might be somewhat irrelevant. Yeah. But that's a great thing. Uh, So the question Peggy asked, just uh, since I already gave the answer, but was uh, you would think he would go after Samuel if he was going after priests in a more systematic way. But I I think he was taking on the, um, I I think this was a situation where he, you know, it's it's interesting. Like, so the way the story reads, there's this kind of report of what was done that isn't actually accurate to what the text says happened. And what Saul does is Saul goes ahead and executes judgment without all the facts, and then kills them. Because he believes they've been treasonous because to help David after he's ordered David's death is treason. So that, that's, what he's, that's what he's doing. But yeah, you'd think he'd be a little afraid of God after he killed God's priests. I hope y'all are afraid of God if you think you're going to take me out, okay? <laughs> all right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The problem with the problem with not having the spirit of God is then how do you know the difference between truth and falsehood? So he doesn't even know which is the right way up. So yeah, of course Saul's going to make mistakes. Yeah. Any questions on Zoom? Um, Want to make sure that that y'all also get to ask questions if you have one. All right.
Well, um, friends, I'll stay for a few minutes and answer any additional questions. I've got about 10 more minutes and then I'll have to get on to my next thing, but it's thank you all for being here. I do remind you next, uh, next week we'll be meeting in the choir room. Uh, there should be sufficient chairs. We'll also, if that doesn't work for you, then I, then I do recommend uh, it, it, we will have Zoom so you can join on Zoom or uh, come to the later meeting. Um, that evening we will meet uh, back here in this room at 6.30. So, but just no food because you need to eat at hearts and hands, okay? All right, well, God bless you. Have a great week. So good to be with you. Thank you.